This morning, what I'd like to talk about is um, something that's a bit more positive than what we've been discussing in previous weeks, and that is really how the hand of God works in the life of man, in fact, in the life of nations. Uh, Because what we've seen in the history of this nation, and other nations have seen it as well, but I think um, Israel and the United States more so than anywhere else in the world, uh, what we've seen is that God intervenes, uh, that he is not silent. There may be long periods of time where he lets the people do whatever the people want to do, including rebelling against him. But ultimately, he intervenes. He intervenes to protect. He intervenes to bless. uh, He intervenes for so many purposes. But in the midst of that, there is always a great turning to God. A portion of that precedes his intervention and another portion afterwards. So today, I'd like to look at just this whole idea of American miracles and look at it in terms related to our current situation. Now, Will Rogers, uh, I suspect that nobody here ever heard him directly in person, um, but he was a great observer of human nature and of the American condition. And he particularly liked to talk about the government. And he said, I don't make jokes, I just watch the government and I report the facts. With Mark Twain, another one who is an observer, there is no distinctly Native American criminal class, he said, except Congress. And he said, suppose you're an idiot, and suppose you were a member of Congress, but then I repeat myself. Well, unfortunately, the current situation is no joke. And to a significant degree, our government has gotten us into that. But an underlying problem is that to some degree, we are the government. We have selected the people who have gotten us into the situation Um, in which we find ourselves. And it may be overwhelming, but God does the impossible. You know, just look at those scattered pictures on the page, the black block of Antifa, the masks that people are wearing almost everywhere, uh, the looting, the firing, the fires, and uh, of course, uh, the upcoming, upcoming voting. Jesus spoke and he said this, it's more difficult for a rich man to get into heaven than for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle, which is obviously impossible. And he notes that. He said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And no matter what the situation, God is able to change things in an instant. God uses, we read in the scriptures, the weak things of this world to confound the wise. And so what is clear is whether you read the polls, whether you read the papers, whether you watch on uh, your television or your computer or your iPhone or or Android, um, right now this is overwhelmingly lopsided and um, most of what is happening is not favorable to God's agenda. Pro-life has largely lost out. Um, uh, We're seeing the advent of people who only care about themselves, who want more and more and will take more. Uh, Marriage is collapsing. You can continue on and on, and you can see all of the difficulties that our society has gotten itself into. This is not 1950s America. But God does intervene. And we've seen it, and you go throughout the scriptures and you see it over and over and over again. A young boy named David kills a great warrior with his slingshot. Nobody would have believed that. A little baby who's cast off into the marshes named Moses becomes a great leader. He's trained in the house of Pharaoh to be a great leader. Forty years he is trained in the house of Pharaoh to be the next Pharaoh. And then 40 years he spends in the wilderness so that at the age of 80, the most unlikely of individuals winds up being completely prepared to be a great leader in the wilderness. And then in the book of Acts, we read about a few fishermen who confound the religious leaders. The very Sanhedrin that had um, sentenced Jesus to death and turned him over to the Romans to be crucified Uh, is the group of people that they are standing before. And in Acts 4.13, as Peter and John 
speak, um, it becomes very obvious to these religious leaders who hated Jesus and who were sought, seeking to extinguish his followers, it becomes very obvious to them that Peter and John are unusual. We read, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Ordinary men who made an extraordinary difference. The men who Jesus selected were just guys, guys you would be happy to go fishing with, play a pickup game of softball with, go to a football game with, guys who carried swords then and would be hunters today. Guys who were used to sleeping under the stars. These were men's men. They weren't rocket scientists or professors. They were just ordinary guys. And when they came to capture Jesus, Peter acted just like an ordinary guy. He took out his sword and he lopped off somebody else's ear. But these ordinary guys went out and they turned the world upside down. God uses ordinary men, he uses ordinary women. It's the testimony of history that a few ordinary men and women were able through prayer, sacrifice, and perseverance to spread the gospel of Jesus to the entire known world in one generation. Paul was a middle-aged businessman. He turned the world upside down and the very things that would have made you say, well, how can God use him? He had no official position. Um, he was not someone in the, um, the geographic center. He was not in Israel. Uh, the gospel spreading out of Antioch. Um, you know, how could God use him? And yet he is the one who was used by God to reach the unsaved throughout the Gentile world. Fast forward 1,700 years. It is also the testimony of history that a few ordinary men were in fact able, through prayer, sacrifice, and perseverance, to free an entire nation from the domination of an ever-expanding and out-of-touch government. The secret that was shared by that band of apostles and by the band of American patriots who founded this great nation was not in the crowds on the street, not in rioting and looting, not in seeking to revolt, but rather it was in the small groups that bonded together on their knees to beseech God to intervene. Andrew Murray, again I will repeat, said this, prayer is the power that moves the hand of God. It is how God acts. God waits and waits and waits and waits on us to pray. And then when we pray, we are told by Jesus, Ask and you will receive, seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. What God looks for is courageous men and women of prayer. Well, we live in a time in the life of America when the hour cries out for ordinary men and women who can trust God to work through them to do extraordinary things. It is a time first and foremost for courageous prayer. Peter's courage came because of his dependence on God. In a few verses prior to what we read, we read this. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to, Sanhedrin, to the Sanhedrin and his captors, rulers and elders of the people, know this. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you today. Peter was risking everything. These were the people who had killed Jesus. But here we read he was filled with the Holy Spirit and that made all the difference because it is the nature of the Holy Spirit to be courageous. He has nothing to fear. And if we are filled with his spirit, we then can go forward knowing that ultimately the victory is ours, not fearful of what might happen. In the early church and actually up until the last few centuries, the primary concern of most believers was to die well, to die in a way that glorifies God. Today, it is far more common to just want to die in our sleep and to live lives that are, live lives that are unmolested by the world. In other words, just let us have peaceful lives doing what we want to do, and whatever else happens, We'll live with that. We'll accept that. That's fine. It doesn't touch us. 
But when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, this all touches you. This is all a concern. What grieves the heart of God grieves us because the grief of the Holy Spirit becomes our grief. And today, undoubtedly, the Holy Spirit is grieved with what is happening in the United States of America. And so before anything else, it is vital that we as individuals seek on a daily basis to be filled with God's Holy Spirit. That is the key. Well, on May 16, 1776, the Continental Congress appointed an official national day of fasting and prayer for the colonies. So the whole day, the entire uh, population of the colonies was asked to fast and pray. The Declaration of Independence was composed and America was founded as a direct result of this prayer just a few weeks late, uh, later on the 4th of July in 1776. Actually, the 3rd of July, uh, but for a variety of reasons, we now celebrate it on the 4th. 56 men, when they signed that pledge, they made a pledge to one another at the bottom when they signed that document. And that pledge was to each other and to God to live or to die to free this nation when they signed that Declaration of Independence. And here is what they they wrote. And you see all the signatures behind on the screen. Quote, for the support of this declaration, with firm reliance on the protection of the divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. They made the revolutionary statement that, quote, Governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Now, before that, it was all about the divine right of kings. Before these men, power always came from might. Kings were thought to be established by God, and so the Declaration of Independence is actually an appeal to God defending the righteousness of their actions and casting off the bonds of the king. Because if the king is appointed by God, how can you rebel against the king? And so in the midst of their document, they wrote this revolutionary statement, all men are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. In other words, rights that the king cannot take away. And this king has. Amongst these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Therefore, King George had no right to take these God-given rights away. Prayer was the power that moved the hand of God. Before the Declaration of Independence, there was nationwide fasting and prayer. Prayer was the power that moved the hand of God to protect and empower the colonial army of George Washington to defeat a far superior foe. I'm going to share just one miracle within that... uh, that conflict, the Battle of Long Island. The British commander of all of the British troops was William Howe, and he was in the midst of moving 30,000 veteran British soldiers to take New York. Uh, You may recall that the headquarters of this government was New York City initially. General George Washington only had 18,000 very inexperienced troops on Long Island and not particularly well equipped. And this was in 1776, so the very beginning of the revolution. Well, Howe's, Howe's troops showed up and easily outflanked Washington. And Washington quickly lost over 1,000 men and he lost two of his top generals. His troops were discouraged and he was concerned that many of the troops would begin deserting the war would have been over almost before it started. And so then something happened. Without any reason, the British halted their troops. This was divine intervention. Had they kept on pressing, they would have most certainly destroyed Washington and his army. The war would have been over, um, and that would have been it. The traitors would have been hung, and this would have been the end of the matter, and the British would have ruled with an iron fist going forward. Yet Washington's troops were still trapped on Long Island. So although the fighting had stopped and no one was being killed at the moment, they were stuck, they were trapped. And so to the east and to the north, they were dealing with Howe's troops and to the west, they had the East River. And at this point in the year, it was treacherous. 
Um, and even more so because there were British warships patrolling the waters. Making matters worse, the weather was extremely stormy and the river really seemed impossible to cross. And so Washington spoke to the troops and he just said, gentlemen, let us pray. And he called for a prayer meeting to ask for God's guidance and help. It reminds you somewhat of Joshua telling his people, well, just march around the walls and we're going to have the victory. George Washington appealed to God. And after praying, he decided that he should attempt to cross the East River. The moon was covered by clouds. Um, And then... God intervenes a second time. And at 11 p.m., the storm suddenly abated and the wind died down. The rain stopped. And the East River was reported as being as smooth as glass. The troops started crossing and a gentle breeze came up behind them to push them along. Without a moon, they weren't seen. They um, they wrapped their oars with lambskin to keep them quiet and they were sneaking across. But even with this miracle, they knew it would still be impossible to get all the troops across to Manhattan Island before daybreak. And so God intervened yet a third time, another small miracle. Just before daybreak, a very thick fog draped over all of them, hiding them from the British troops. It was so thick that they said they could not see the front of the boat from the back. Sometimes they couldn't see the person next to them in the boat. Well, when the fog lifted, the British commander, Howe, was shocked, as you might imagine, because Washington's troops had indeed escaped. And God had miraculously preserved this ragtag colonial army from the overwhelmingly superior forces of the British. Washington and his men viewed this as a direct answer to their prayer, and they viewed it as a miracle. God had intervened on their behalf. Can you imagine what it must have been like when they were surrounded uh, by Howe's troops, knowing that what they faced was certain death, humanly speaking. And now suddenly, they're on the other side of the East River, and there is no simple way for Howe to get his army across. Well, after Camp Cornwallis surrendered, several years later, and the founding fathers were victorious over the British. King George's tyranny was now ended. These very ordinary men who had been farmers and lawyers and printers and other things prior um, embarked on a very noble experiment, the creation of a government without a king. This was a big thing, a government in which the people would rule themselves. It had never been done before but they didn't know how to implement such a government. And so they again appealed to God. On Thursday, June 28th, 1787, the Constitutional Convention was deadlocked with partisanship. People were shouting and screaming at one another. And this time it was Ben Franklin who called them to pray. He stood and at 81, he said, I've seen many things. But I know this, God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? And he then called for prayer. And as you know, prayers have opened all subsequent meetings uh, of that convention and both houses of Congress ever since. Now, this was not the type of thing that was put forward without critics. Alexander Fraser Teitler had warned against a republic. And in 1770, um, you know, almost a decade before um, the, um, the colonies saw, won their independence, he warned this. He said, a democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It can only exist until a majority of voters discover that they can vote themselves generous gifts out of the public treasury. From that moment on, the majority always vote for the candidates who promise the most benefits from the public treasury. That was what he thought. 
And he put forward a cycle, the Titler cycle, that it starts in faith, moves to courage, and then to liberty, and then from there to abundance. And once the people have experienced abundance for a period of time, they become selfish, and then they become complacent, and then there is apathy, and that apathy leads to dependence. And from dependence, you drop into bondage. And it is when you drop into bondage that a state moves back to faith, typically through some type of uh, revolution. Well, Madison responded to that concern, as did others of the founders. They understood the concern. They believed the antidote was for the populace to depend on God rather than the government. And they were convinced that the way to do that was through the teaching of core Christian principles. Madison has said, we have staked the whole future of American civilization, not on the power of government, far from it. We have staked the future of all of our political institutions upon the capacity of mankind for self-government, upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves, to control ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. So he felt that the antidote to Titler's concern was the Ten Commandments, that if we are following God's Ten Commandments, we will not drop into selfishness. We will be altruistic. We will be concerned about our neighbor. We will love our neighbor as our, ourselves. And hence, their needs will have equal weight, at least, as our needs. And for a Christian, it should be even greater weight. But now what we see is most people pray to the government first. Titler's fears are coming to pass. Free health care, free college, reparations, free everything. We pray to the government to bail us out. Oh, Mr. President, give me a job. Oh, Mr. Congressman. Oh, Mr. Senator. Senator, Please get those jobs back from India and from China. Oh, please heal me. Please keep me from getting COVID. Please bail me out of my personal debt on my house. Please force my employer to keep me, and so on. We turn to the government. And so we now have a state that wants to be God. And we have people who want to seek to control this nation who believe the government is indeed God. The very concept of socialism is a religion in which the state is God. It is how it, that is how it was in fascist Italy. That is how it was in Nazi Germany. That is how it is in Marxist um, Russia. That is how it is uh, in Maoist uh, China, we will wind up with a God state. The only problem is you need to be omnipotent to be God, and the federal government does not have the power to pull it off. They will run out of money. They will run out of resources. And the massive amount of money they are borrowing even now and printing um, risks enslaving and indebting our children for generations to come, regardless of who wins this next election. So what should we do? Ultimately, we're the government. So it is time for us to start governing. We need to work as we have never worked before to get people elected who represent what is good and decent and right, men and women of integrity. I would also recommend that those who can't run for office locally and nationally, but most especially we need to pray for our leaders in our country at this dark time when the very future of our way of life is threatened, both from outside invaders and misguided leaders. The moral capital of past generations has now dissipated. It is we who must make a new deposit. It is we who must restore our nation to fulfill the founding father's dream. Now, let me encourage you with this. In 1857, the United States was in spiritual, political, and economic decline. Many people were disillusioned with spiritual things because of preachers who had repeatedly predicted the end of the world in the 1840s. When it didn't come, then the baby was thrown out with the bathwater. And there were a lot of people who just rejected Christianity as having anything to do with today. And then there was disagreement on slavery that was growing and growing. There were those uh, in the um, abolition movement uh, who were getting louder and louder, and it was becoming more and more obvious that the slavery issue had to be addressed. There were free states and there were slave states. And this was breeding massive political unrest. And for many, civil war seemed near. Well, on September 23rd, 1857, in New York City, 
a businessman named Jeremiah Lanfear posted a little notice on his shop window on Fulton Street, um, which for those of you who've not been there, it's in downtown Manhattan, right near the financial district. And he was urging people to join him to pray for revival every noontime. Well, six people showed up. The prayer meeting spread across the entire country, though. And in 1858, the revival started and actually continued throughout the Civil War. Well, the, what happened was after that first prayer meeting and the daily prayer meetings where they have six, eight, ten, by the third week, 40 people showed up at the prayer meeting. And then the Bank of Philadelphia failed and financial panic hit because you had the crash of October 1857. Banks failed, railroads went bankrupt, factories closed, unemployment increased massively, and on October 10th, the stock market crashed. Suddenly, people were flocking to the prayer meetings, and within six months, 10,000 people were gathering daily for prayer in New York City alone. They had to rent out several movie theaters. Uh, They met in several churches. They met in various places throughout the area. Prayer meetings spread to other cities. In Chicago, the Metropolitan Theater was filled every day with 2,000 praying people. In Louisville, several thousand came to the Masonic Temple for prayer each morning. In Cleveland, 2,000 assembled for daily prayer. In St. Louis, churches were filled throughout the city for months at a time. In, In many places, tents were set up for prayer because they couldn't find places big enough for the prayer meetings to meet. The YMCA also played an important role. They held prayer meetings at all their locations, and they worked to spread revival throughout the country. Well, the media started to take notice, and in February 1858, uh, a New York Herald reporter, Gordon Bennett, gave very extensive coverage to the prayer revival, uh, talking about the different cities and what was happening in the different cities. In April, the New York Tribune devoted an entire issue to the news of the revival. And then the news of the revival traveled west now by telegraph, something that hadn't existed in previous revivals. The impact nationwide was such that a man returning by train from Chicago to New York was able to report, quote, there was a meeting praying for revival at every stop of the train, unquote. Well, it was a simple formula that spread ultimately worldwide. Lay people, not church leaders, led. Prayer, not preaching, was the main focus. The meetings were informal. Any person might pray, speak, lead in a song, or give a word of testimony with a five-minute limit placed on each speaker. And so the small prayer meeting of Jeremy Lanfear led to the third great awakening. And the revival then spread beyond America. It spread to Ireland, Scotland, Wales, England, Europe, South Africa, India, Australia, and the Pacific Islands. There was a massive revival in the Confederate troops that you can read about as well that stemmed from this. On both sides of the upcoming Civil War, you had many, many, many relatively new believers who had come to the Lord through this revival. Well, now we need another one. Now is the appointed time. And so I would call on each of us to pray because we need to batter down the doors of heaven with our prayer. We need to march and make noise and openly call upon the God of heaven. He has said clearly, quote, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and confess their sin and turn from their wicked ways, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. The hour is late. We see it, we know it, we understand it. But the opportunity is even greater. And in the economy of God, he waits for moments like this to give an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but he does not do it unless the people pray. And specifically, I believe, fasting and prayer are what is called for. Now, in another week or two, Uh, There have been many groups that have joined together to call for a time of prayer and fasting. I believe this is the most critical thing that is going to happen in the next four or five weeks. And I would urge you to participate in any way that you possibly can. Now is the appointed time. God bless you.
Thank you.